Hello and welcome back to Cambro Conversations. Today's conversation, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Dean St. Mark. Dean, thanks for joining me. Thanks very much, Colin. I know uh, this was one special request from someone on your story, so thank you very much. Yes, that's it. I think there's a percentage of guests when I'll become aware of them because of the nature of asking, who do you want to hear after episode 100 or episode 110 or whatever? And when somebody comes forward with a guest name, of course, you dive onto their Instagram profile. But I also, as a good practice, will search their name on Spotify or Apple and I'll find other episodes they've done and some of the key topics they've covered. And the key topics you covered, Dean, were all ones that I was like, yes, absolutely. The audience, the demographic are going to love that rather than just one particular special request from a follower. It's quite often if one person's brave enough to say it, a lot of other people will want it as well. They just haven't either realized they want it or they haven't verbalized it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm delighted. I'm delighted that they've suggested me. So I'm always happy to come on podcast and have a chat with people. Fantastic, Dean. So I'd love to go back to the start of your academic career to understand where all this knowledge that comes from, because of course, we're going to get into the applicable nature of it. But you're a man that has the, the relevant credentials as well. Yeah, so so like you said, I'm Dr. Dean St. Mart. Um, where everything sort of started, originally I did want to be a medical doctor growing up. And at some point in my like uh, mid-teens, as I was approached the end of high school, secondary school, I realized that the life of a medical doctor wasn't really for me in terms of the roadblocks, the, f- the family life, etc. That I just realized... <sighs> In 10 years' time, do I really want to be in that sort of career? Where I had a big interest, and this was sort of thanks to my uh, like career advisor in secondary school, he said, you know, you've got one of the best talents in school for science. So what about there's a, a new degree course that's opening up in the university, which is only like a 10-minute journey from my parents' house in pharmacology and chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. And I had a look at it and we have like a point system in Ireland for how you get into university, depending on your grades, when you do your exams. And because it was a new course, the points in Ireland are determined based off the popularity of the course, not how difficult the course is, but how many people apply for it. So like if you imagine like nuclear physics, you might only need like four C's to get into because no one's applying for it. (laughs) So the system is a bit flawed. But this new course, the entry requirements, not that it really mattered to me, but were, were quite low. So it showed me that there wasn't a huge demand for it to start. And I knew relatively easily I'd get in based off having to get, you need to get five A's to do medicine and a B. So it's quite, quite competitive. So I, I, I went to Minute University in Calair and finished top of the university in chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. And I was offered two scholarships to do a PhD. Um, I always laugh because of, I'm, people would be surprised by this, but I've never really had like a five-year goal or plan. It was sort of like I got, I got to the end of my degree. I was working as a part-time pharmacist dispenser. So I was reading prescriptions and dispensing medications with a pharmacist. And they were like egging me on to be a pharmacist that, you know, now you've done your pharmacology degree. Why don't you spend another four years, breeze through pharmacy school and finish at 25 as a pharmacist. Um, And to me, that that career wasn't really exciting. So I, I guess I just approached one of my lecturers who was very interested in terms of organic chemistry and just said, I'd like to do a PhD. And we sort of set up all the, the paperwork for the scholarships. Finished my PhD in 2013, where we'd done research into a new class of fluorescent molecules, so molecules that glow. Okay. And my whole project was trying to figure out why it glows throughout the physics of why these particular molecules glow when you shine ultraviolet light on them and try and develop it into potentially a diagnostic tool. And I thought this was amazing when I was starting my PhD that when you looked into fluorescent diagnostics, if you can imagine a surgeon could inject you with something that targets cancer cells. 
So it's like something like a Star Trek where like you're giving someone this die and all of a sudden surgeons doing surgery under, you know, dark conditions with ultraviolet light and the tumor's glowing bright green or bright blue and he knows exactly how much tissue to cut out to remove that cancerous tissue. Yeah, incredible. And I thought, this is absolutely amazing. Now, we're, we're not really just there just yet in terms of fluorescent diagnostics, but it, I'd say in the next 15 years, we'll be at a, a point whereby we'll have fluorescent molecules that basically what limits this as a diagnostic is the commercially available molecules photo bleach. And what that means is they destroy themselves. Once you shine ultraviolet light, they glow, but the ultraviolet light destroys the molecule. Yep. So you only get like a split second of light and then it disappears. What my job was, my molecules actually had a very long fluorescent life. Okay. To the point that I done an experiment where we shone ultraviolet light on the molecule for over 10 hours and it was still glowing. So you can imagine, you know, a glow stick, when you smash a glow stick and eventually it goes out, that's because the molecules are getting destroyed from fluorescing. So I basically had like a never ending glow stick molecule. You could put it that way. <laughs> and it had a medical application to try and support with surgeries. I understand. That's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, you can imagine the interesting conversations where if I went out to a nightclub wearing jeans, I was wearing in the lab and I splashed some of it on my jeans. My jeans are glowing bright green. <laughs> <laughs> in the raves yeah so eventually um i finished my phd and again no real plan i was offered to be a, a principal investigator so you can continue your research in academia so basically i was to continue doing this fluorescent project with the hopes of maybe turning it into a commercial application but academia is is ruthless in that if you don't secure funding, you're basically begging people for money to keep your lab open. And I didn't like the fact that you didn't have really any job security as a researcher. Yes, as, as a lectureship position, you'd have security there as a public job. But aside from that, to fund the running of your lab, to fund your research, to buy research chemicals, etc., you need a lot of funding to keep that lab part open. And obviously you need money then to have other students, master students, PhD students underneath you doing research alongside you. So you have to pay them and you have to pay their research costs. And I, I just figured again that I really don't want to spend a life of just chasing people for money and um, that, the opportunity was there, obviously, to continue academia, but I just decided at that point I'm going to opt out. And I was given a talk in Trinity College, and there was a gentleman there, and he was giving a talk about Intel. And I, I just went up to him after, the, after his lecture and just said to him, you know, how would, how would I get a job at Intel? Now, Intel was literally five minutes down the road from my university. <laughs> So I'm thinking in my head, you know, I, I don't even have to travel. I'm traveling that way anyway, every day for the last eight years. And he just said to me, give me your CV. And from there, I, uh, I got an interview and got accepted into to Intel as a, a chemical engineer. So and what does a chemical engineer do, Dean? So where I joined, so basically Intel has so many different departments, um, you know, what, what's involved in sort of computer chip generation. And I ended up um, being, I guess, placed into their plasma etch department. So what, what we used was um, a high pressure gas to create a plasma. So we all know solid, liquid, gas, but there's actually a fourth state of matter and it's plasma. So that's when you have a, a gas that's under huge pressure and it then disperses into electrical ions so we, we we chemically charge that inert gas into ions so for example you could have fluorine gas but as a plasma it's now fluorine ions so basically they're very reactive and we get them to do chemical reactions when they're very active like that so i 
I started off, um, the whole point of joining Intel was that they had a new production factory that was being built and qualified. So they wanted um, scientists, I guess, to help qualify the factory and qualify um, the, I guess, production machines in order to, to run correctly. And obviously the underlying mechanical science, chemical science, physics. So when I joined, I actually had no background in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and I'm I'm basically working my way up to being a, a, a shift engineer whereby I'm in charge of my department's machines. So I'm basically reporting on how these machines operate, if they break, putting a, a plan in place to fix it. And we're talking about massive sums of money being turned over every hour from my machines. So, you know, if something breaks, 10 minutes costs a lot of money. Um, so I like the challenge of it and that I was sort of like the, the lead engineer and I had a team of guys that helped maintain the machines. There's a lot of problem solving. One of the things that I learned at the very start was when you're trying to figure out a very complex problem, normally it's the simplest solution that ends up being the problem. <laughs> we, had a, we had one part on our machine basically and it, it's like a tuner and it's trying to tune out bad frequencies of energy, put it that way. Yeah. Sometimes the tuner doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And if you didn't understand how it worked, like basically going to all this physics and whatever of how this tuner has these metal rods that move up and down, whatever. The simplest solution when the tuner wouldn't work is to just turn it off and turn it back on again. Yep. And the internal configuration just puts it back to where it should be. Like, I mean, you're, you're going back to one of these simple solutions when you call up like a call center and say, have you tried turn it off and turn it back on again? It's the IT department, every person's <laughs> job. <laughs> so uh, that, that whole, I, I spent seven and a half years there and it was amazing. The, the team who I worked alongside, I mean, I was quite sad to, to actually at the point when the opportunity came to join supplement needs I, I was quite sad because I mean supplement needs and the whole area of formulating supplements um, came as a hobby I, I was just helping a friend with his business and in the process me getting to make supplements sort of for myself as well so it was it was a, a beneficial or a mutual beneficial agreement and I never really planned on even like becoming where I am now as product manager for supplement needs. It was just, I had such an interest and I seen how the supplement industry operates and obviously um, the whole side of functional medicine and trying to create supplements that get to the root cause of problems. That when the opportunity came, I, I figured, you know, I'll be 34 this year. If I don't do it now, I'm going to look back and go, well, I could have easily stayed in Intel. I was climbing the ranks to like I was a senior engineer there. Um, I could have easily comfortably stayed there for the rest of my life um, in terms of what they give to you as an employee, your perks, benefits. But I knew that's, that's a steady job. And what I, what, again, what I realized in Intel was when, you, when you're there, seven and a half years went like that. Yeah. And, and I'm like looking back and going, geez, like I've nearly done the time I done in university for my degree and my PhD in Intel, but it doesn't even seem like that length of time. Of course. And, and you see other guys that are there 25 years who are coming up to retirement and you're thinking like, maybe they're even thinking the same that, gosh, I started as like in my 20s and now I'm almost in my mid 50s. Where is that time gone? Yeah, exactly that. And it's interesting and, that this side passion that you had through your bodybuilding and through your understanding of drug design and then supplements has led to a career where you're applying this knowledge you've got, but it's also in an area that you care about deeply. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this all sort of came along sort of serendipitously from my wife. I've said this often that when I met my wife years ago, um, she was a, a bikini competitor and I was a bodybuilder. And um, 
she said to me, you know, you've got too much knowledge here. Obviously, I was starting to apply this sort of functional medicine approach to my own health as a bodybuilder. And she said, you need to start like educating people on what you know. And, you know, when I be telling her about certain things that are uh, someone in the gym would say something to me and I tell them, like, why are you doing that? And then they'd say, oh, because such and such said so. And then when I start explaining the, the, the root science to it to them, they're like, look at me going, why isn't anyone saying this to people? So I was happy having chats to people in the gym that would come up and chat to me and I'd give them a bit of knowledge, but I wasn't really interested in social media. And eventually Morgan convinced me, like, you need to start doing stories on Instagram. And I guess that sort of led into me. I stayed away from forums, bodybuilding forums, all this sort of stuff online because it just irritated me that when you start talking sense, guys like, what do you know? You know, like they, they, they refused to accept the actual like dogmatic science of what I was saying was correct because of like 20 previous years of bro science, what you'd call. Of course. So when I started, obviously, I, I was just a member of Trained by JP and they had just a form and I just started telling guys out straight when they'd say something, I'd be like, no, that's completely wrong because... And I'd explain that to them the reason. And what, what really interested me was we had this whole scenario whereby, um, not to get into it all, but like with steroids, people go, steroids cause heart disease. You're going to die because you took steroids. And I wanted to take that stigma away with functional medicine and go, well, actually, do you understand why they cause heart disease? The same way with supplement needs, but even the general population, do you know why you have high blood pressure? or why potentially you have problems with your liver or your pancreas. I mean, you start asking these questions, root cause problems. It was sort of like the same with engineering. Why has that machine broke? And you'd never, you'd never try to, okay, sometimes you might get desperate and you might like try and do like a, a, an interim fix on a machine to get it to run for another hour and then go, right, no, you have to actually fix it properly. And you take it down and you fix it properly. But when you look at the analogy to medicine, you conventional medicine is all based around symptoms. And this was what sort of drove me away from even drug design after my PhD, because I realized ethically, when you're doing drug design, you have a, a, a problem statement. So say diabetes. Now, the intelligent decision would be to drive all the way down to the root causes of diabetes and go, well, and how can we stop that root cause from being developed? And then you start realizing, well, a lot of the root cause issues for diabetes, say, are, are lifestyle or genetically driven. There's no sort of, I guess, medicine that's going to intervene in someone's lifestyle. It might alleviate some of the symptoms, but the lifestyle has to actually be changed by that person that mental approach to that symptom and i realized i can't do this i can't develop drugs that basically just treat symptoms yes they change quality of life but we're never ever given that patient full health yes the symptom for example high blood pressure you you go to see your, your doctor with high blood pressure yes your blood pressure might be excessively high and dangerously high and there's there's an immediate cause there for medication if you have high blood pressure undiagnosed you're going to have kidney issues and potentially issues towards clots etc so yes intervene immediately give it give a drug treat the symptom get the blood. at that point you should be thinking to yourself well why was my blood pressure high in the first place was it chronic stress was it my diet? Was it genetics? Because again, certain people have a genetic susceptibility to high blood pressure that runs through their family. And you can't, you can't override that genetics, which is amazing because we've created a drug then that counteracts that symptom of genetics. And that's great then. So your quality of life improves, symptoms subside. And unfortunately, you do have to take a medication because there's nothing you can't do anything else to stop it. So that's that's a brilliant medical intervention. Yes, but ethically, you said that you would much rather there was more support around addressing the lifestyle factors, and that, that yeah. small percentage that need it would, of course, get the the reactive exactly. medication. Exactly. I mean, even 
even the science behind um, statins for high cholesterol. A statin will block um, what's known as the malavena pathway. And basically what that does is it, it creates LDL and HDL particles from dietary cholesterol. And basically when you take a statin, you just tell your body, right, you can't make LDL and HDL, you block it. Now, there's an intimate connection here that, yes, when you have high levels of LDL particles that cause heart disease, that when you take a statin, you're reducing the amount of LDL in your body. But there's a whole new understanding that oxidation, so when your body encounters free radicals, which basically attack your body cells, and that's why we have antioxidant defense mechanisms in the body, when the LDL gets oxidized and attacked, it becomes dysfunctional and your body's defense mechanism to that is to use your immune system to remove that LDL particle out of your blood because it's, it's, it's seen as a threat. And in doing so, that is what generates plaque. It's not the LDL building up on the walls of your arteries. It's actually your immune system removing this bad dysfunctional LDL that's become damaged and puts it inside the inner wall of the artery. Um, if you want to read more into it, you can look into foam cells and um, cardiovascular disease. Yeah, incredible, Dean. And I think that's just one example of what I've heard you describe before as a pill for nil approach um, mm -hmm. that modern society has. What yeah. would you, how would you describe that and why is that such an issue? So... <laughs> You're, we're now at a point whereby people's mentalities, when they, I guess, when they go to say their GP, if, and, and this has been surveyed several times, if you give someone the option of, okay, well, you can't have X, Y, and Z food, I need you to exercise this amount, I need you to make this lifestyle intervention, you could list off maybe six or seven things to that person that would dramatically change their life. But in the process of, I guess, us developing over our lifetime, we develop habits and pain points that change can be such a dramatic thing and we have resistance to change. That's the biggest problem when we have habit formation, that resistance to someone telling you, you should be doing this. That if they're given this option of six or seven things that need to change versus, well, I'll write you a prescription and this will have your LDL just like that. Most of the time, you're going to take the easy option and go, okay, yeah, I'm going to take that pill and I'm just going to go about living my life. Yeah. Where that becomes a problem when you approach it to the cardiovascular disease approach is that when you take a statin, like I said, it will have your LDL. But if that LDL is still getting oxidized all the time, so if it's getting damaged in your body, you're still creating plaque. So while you might have an LDL value, say, of six, which is very high, all of a sudden it's now three and your doctor's going, oh, that's great. Your LDL three. You're very healthy. Imagine that full six was being oxidized all the time. So you're generating plaque very quickly over your lifetime. When you take the statin and you go back to a level of three, if your diet and lifestyle stays the same, you're still oxidizing the LDL at the same rate as if it was at six. You've just caused a 50% reduction in your risk. So where that patient might have a heart attack in 10 years with an LDL value of, of uh, six, they might have a heart attack, say, in 15 years' time. So you're just moving the goalposts. It could even be shorter. That person with a statin, without the statin, they might have a heart attack in two and a half years. And with the statin, it moves to five because you've inherently halved the LDL, so you've halved the plaque formation. It's a sticking plaster over a gaping wound, isn't it? It's not the real fix yeah. where functional I mean, medicine goes towards. Imagine you said to someone, okay, here's a statin. So all of a sudden we've halved your cholesterol. So we've halved that risk of arteriosclerosis. But now I want you to, you know, take in this food, reduce this food. 
actively engage with antioxidant intake. So your fruits, vegetables, vitamin E, vitamin C. From there now, you've halved your LDL risk, but we've also halved your oxidation risk. So we've given you even more time. So the, the intervention with a pill for an ill, yes, our advancement in medicine um, prolongs basically our lifespan. <laughs> And there's a brilliant book called The Telomere Effect, and a, and a basis by two Nobel laureates. Um, and they basically, one of them is called um, Elizabeth Blackburn. In that book, they basically describe that you have your lifespan and you have your disease span. So your lifespan is when your health is in full effect and everything is amazing. And then you have your disease span, whereby aging processes start to enter and we start to basically rapidly age. The goal, obviously, of modern medicine is to extend our lifespan and decrease our disease span. What we don't want is an overlap of the two, whereby the, there's this blurred line between, yes, you're increasing lifespan, but the disease span is still underneath in the background following it. And then all of a sudden you run out of lifespan and quickly disease span has always been there in the background. And like that, you rapidly age as well with certain uh, health issues. So the pill for an ill, um, that was from a book by a guy called um, uh, Dr. Kazarian. He's wrote so many different books. And I, I remember reading that in like the introduction to the book was like, geez, that makes that makes so much sense to what I was thinking, you know, pre prior to that about root cause symptoms and getting to that root cause problem. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I guess, you know, you could ask anyone, you know, about their medication, et cetera. And they, more than likely they just accepted the medication without the education of how, how else they can go about intervening with potential health issues. Yeah. And that's some of the areas that I'd, I'd love to go with you today, Dean. And one of the big topics in the last couple of years has been our immune systems. And yeah. I would love to understand a bit more about what role inflammation plays within our health and our immune systems, because I know it's a topic that you know an awful lot about, but it seems yeah. to be quite badly misunderstood. Yeah. So basically inflammation is such a broad termed topic to a process in the body that that basically is just saying that something's become dysfunctional. That's how I sort of view it as a very simple way. So when something is inflamed, it's telling the body that there's a, an out of state balance and that we need to correct the problem and remove this inflammation. So the inflammation is sort of like a, a messaging signal to tell your body, hey, something's not right here. And a, a good way of understanding it is your body makes what are known as cytokines. And cytokines are inflammatory messenger molecules that your immune system creates to signal to other immune cells, oh, this is what's going on in the body. And in response to those cytokine production, if you create enough cytokines, they all go to your liver and your liver senses this high level of cytokine in the body and creates what's called C-reactive protein. And C-reactive protein is sort of like this um, mega fighter that will then enter into your bloodstream and start targeting things that's causing inflammation to destroy it. So you can do your blood work for C-reactive protein and you can see how inflamed your body is. Um, now, this becomes a very important thing towards our overall health because CRP is a brilliant thing when you have, say, a viral infection. Um, say you have a cough or a cold, even the flu. Your body will make massive amounts of CRP to kill off what's present. And you'll see that if you do your blood work, if you go for a health check and you have a cold or flu, your CRP is going to be sky high at like 15 or 20 when the, the sort of top of the range is five. Ideally, when you have perfect health, your CRP should be nearly zero. Your body has no reason to make these cytokines. All your immune cells are happy in your bloodstream. There's nothing under attack. They're all living in a state of nice balance. 
but let's say then you develop um small arterial injuries from high blood pressure or from oxidation from stuff attacking your the, the walls of your arteries bear in mind your arteries have one cell structures called the, epi, uh, uh, the endothelium around your artery so you have a single cell like the, the, like how i guess um delicate your artery is when you really think about it that that single cell endothelial cell basically imagine having one single skin cell protecting your arteries um if one of them gets damaged it will trigger off an inflammation cascade similarly if we get cut when you get cut that signals off an inflammation cascade because bacteria in the air uh, dirt etc passes into the wound and your body goes oh hang on we've an open wound there white blood cells come to the area help clean up debris help clean up some of the dead cells that have been cut etc you have the platelets can clot in the blood and basically your immune system is on high alert waiting for something to pass through the barrier of your skin when that happens in your arteries basically you start to develop this low level inflammatory response in your body where your immune system is trying to hunt for something but actually the injury is inside the body and that's why we can start to see with say inflammation we can track crp if crp is any higher than one on blood work it's telling us there's an inflammatory process in the body. Now, if you've chronically low levels of CRP all your life, it's telling you that something is not right in the body. And normally it's a predictor for cardiovascular disease. If you have CRP between one and three chronically over years, it's telling you there's a, an inflammatory process happening in the body daily. When it comes to the immune system, you want a fully functioning immune system in that there's no overlapping signals. There's nothing, um, I guess, telling the immune system to do something when it shouldn't. Yep. Even with today's current environment, um, we're not really seeing it now. But in the beginning, with the very first strain of, of what we have now today, a lot of people suffered quite badly because of inflammation. And we had what was called that cytokine storm. Why that occurred was this pathogen could infiltrate the deep lining of your lung. Now, this is a part of your body that's heavily protected and shouldn't really be exposed to pathogens. So when something enters into that area, you really want to make sure that the immune cells that are present there understand what's going on and ask for the appropriate help to bring in more white blood cells to do their job to help clean up what's going on. Understood. When, when the immune system is dysfunctional, it starts sending mixed signals because of this chronic low-grade inflammation. And what can happen is the cytokine storm that we all read about was basically your immune system flooding to this site of infection, not knowing how to deal with it, and basically throwing everything that it's got at your body. Now, we have to sort of imagine when your immune system is fighting a pathogen, it's like a battlefield. So when your body makes cytokines and other toxic substances to kill pathogens there is i guess um a, an acknowledgement that you're you're going to kill some healthy tissue as a compromise your, your immune system understands that okay well if something's over there in order for me to kill it i might have to have collateral damage it does a cost benefit analysis dean and it takes action to eliminate the exactly big Exactly. And that normally that cost benefit analysis might be a couple of cells that are in the surround environment and the body doesn't really care. It'd rather get rid of pathogen and then know how to repair the cells that have been damaged. The best way I can explain like a cytokine storm is imagine having like one terrorist 
in in a village of say a thousand people, and you send in an army, you'd you'd think that this army could find this one person in a village quite easily and eliminate the threat with with relative low collateral damage. What was happening was you had again this sort of one terrorist in a village and they're sending in helicopters with napalm and just burning the village to kill that one guy and what you had was your immune system creating massive amounts of cytokines and destroying lung tissue yep. which is quite difficult to repair and then these patients had complications etc so that low level inflammation it's vital that we we give the body the correct nourishment in order for it to do its job correctly, but understand there are other factors such as adipose cells, so fat cells, they create massive amounts of cytokines naturally. And it's just it's just what they do. They, they're an organ themselves, technically, like muscle mass, and they create their own signaling molecules. And unfortunately for adipose, it's cytokines. So when you have a lot of adipose tissue, you're chronically making high amounts of cytokines in the background. Um, and a- again, that then gets the immune system to be sort of on high alert and irritated. And when you encounter a pathogen, that immune response might be more dysfunctional than beneficial. Yes. So that would explain to a large extent why if you have a lot of adipose tissue, a lot of fat, if you are classed as obese, then of course your immune system would struggle more with a new virus or even more commonly um, traditional viruses, should we say? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And and even having having levels of obesity, you know, the last two years of data have started to really show this message. And again, it's a very it's a very delicate message that we have to deliver to the public again, because we you know, in terms of equality, et cetera. But we have to be unbiased to, to the data showing that, you know, if there's X present, then Y is the response. Yep. And understanding from a non-emotional perspective that if you have these characteristics and it's part of your lifestyle and you don't want to change or change is difficult, try and provide a way of encouraging or giving the education to create the change but understand that if you're resistant or you do not want to change well then here's here's the outcome and here's basically from the root cause what the disease presents from it in contrast to putting ourselves at risk and our immune system at risk with obesity and a lot of fat tissue what are the predictors of good metabolic health um, predict is a good metabolic health. So like I said, very low levels of CRP in your blood work will show that you have low levels of inflammation and um, low resting heart rate. Um, so ideally somewhere between 60 to 80 beats per minute is sort of the, the norm. Um, athletes tend to have much lower into the 50s and high 40s for uh, rest and heart rate. Your rest and heart rate variability so you can track your heart rate variability, which is the time between each beat of your heart. So we can measure in milliseconds the, 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 I guess, the difference in time between each beat of your heart. Having high heart rate variability means that the, the time between each beat is spaced out. So the heart, even though you might think that, you know, 60 beats per second, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, within that, we can start to see millisecond differences between each beat. The longer that gap is between each beat, it's sort of saying that the body's in a state of rest and digest. So it's it's restful. It's in that, um, what we'd call a parasympathetic nervous system state, PNS. If you have low heart rate variability, Again, it could be genetic. So we don't want to say to people, okay, low HRV is a bad thing, but it's telling us that between each beat of your heart, the time is shorter. So a lot of people who do um, desk work, long periods of sitting, 
especially chronically over time, tend to have lower levels of HRV because their, their heart is working at a constant state because they're constantly, you know, engaging in an activity, whether that's work or on a laptop or on their phone, whatever. Whereas those who are more engaged in active work who are moving about tend to have higher HRV. Um, so that tells you, it's, it, it gives you an insight into the state of your system, whether you're in this fight or flight, which is sympathetic, or rest and digest, which is parasympathetic. So that gives you an idea then towards your metabolic health, because if you're constantly in this sympathetic nervous system state, the fight or flight, you're pumping out catecholamines like adrenaline in order to have your body operating at a high rate. So you're burning more fuel in order to keep the brain active and in order to keep your tissues active. So more glucose, uh, potentially more fat being burned. But you also have high levels of cortisol, which is our stress hormone in our body. So you can measure your cortisol on your blood work to see is it low or is it high? And both have consequences. So ideally, when you do your blood work in the morning time, you want high cortisol because it's, we use that to wake our bodies up. That's the awakening hormone. If you have low levels of cortisol in the morning, it's telling your body slightly dysfunctional because if you're not making enough cortisol to wake your body up, because either your adrenal gland that makes cortisol is being overworked throughout the day, or there's issues there with that circadian rhythm where your body's running on a 24-hour clock. And you might be making more cortisol later in the day, closer to bedtime, when you want your body relaxing with lower cortisol. Trying to get into that parasympathetic state with low cortisol it, for optimal sleep. Yeah, exactly. And then I guess the other one then finally would be um, blood work. You can look at your iron status. So high levels of iron can cause issues with your arteries. Um, and the other one is glucose, high levels of glucose. So ideally, we want our blood glucose level to be less than 4.5. Now, when you get your bloods done, the actual reference range is up to 6.5. Now, we know that there is research here that for every 0.1 of a millimole with your bloods, when you do your fast and blood glucose, going from 4.5 to 5 increases your risk of cardiovascular disease by about three to five percent very low percentage but once you start going above five you can see then that this escalates quite quickly so when you get to say six you've now increased your risk potentially by about nine to ten percent and that's because glucose is an oxidant in our blood and how our blood deals with that is by glycating red blood cells when you do your blood work, you'll see this marker called hemoglobin, HbA1c. And that is a marker of how much glucose is stuck to your red blood cells. So your red blood cells have a defense mechanism whereby it stores glucose on the red blood cell. In the event that you had a, a serious hypoglycemic event, body would release glucagon, which tells your body to release stored glucose into the body, all your red blood cells can quickly dump this glucose into the bloodstream to fuel cells that need it rapidly for energy. So the HbA1c gives you an idea of how much glucose has gone onto your red blood cells because, for example, your cells might be resistant to taking that glucose on board because either you've lost insulin sensitivity or you're not making enough insulin, where insulin helps glucose be brought into cells. Yeah, that's an incredible amount of information there, Dean. But I think if I was to think back and have some headlines within that, a lot of what yeah. you're saying is around looking after our metabolic health comes from movement, even if we are a desk and office worker. It comes exactly. from maintaining a level of... Um, health in terms of our, our iron levels, our glucose levels, but particularly that area around heart rate, of course, that'll be helped by movement, but that's probably also helped by 
body weight by activity levels in terms of putting ourselves under more stress than just movement. I'm a big advocate of that morning walk or that lunchtime walk to break up your day. And I even yeah. at times I will do some of my Zoom calls standing to get some sort of movement. And of course, a lot of people would look at that from a, a calorie burn perspective, but it's actually about much more than that. It's about your heart rate availability and your general health. Exactly. Yeah. You've, you've nailed, I've gone a little bit too into the science and I'm, I'm bad for doing that sometimes, but the, the key message there, like you said, is uh, movement, daily movement, uh, daily nutrition, and um, obviously trying to avoid activities that bring high stress and social media, etc., is a devil for keeping our, um, I guess our CNS stimulated. So we're in that sympathetic nervous system state um, even sort of where we, where I sort of got a big interest, where I, I, my first sort of entry into functional medicine was sleep, and understanding um, the mechanisms of sleep, and that all arose because of a, a personal need to understand sleep. Why that became important was when I began as a shift engineer. I never worked shift in my life, so. I mean, you, you sit down, this sort of comes back to even corporate education. I got an hour talk on um, lifestyle management for shift workers. Um, and some of the stuff that's in that material is completely wrong. And it's, it's dangerously wrong in what you're told to do. So I realized I was a bodybuilder. I was prepping for bodybuilding shows. So I understood the, the critical need for sleep to recover from my training, for fat loss, for appetite regulation. So I knew how critical sleep was to me that when I worked night shift, I had to ensure that no matter what time of the day I was asleep, whether it was nighttime or daytime, I was still getting the same quality of sleep. And you'll find people who work night shift will tell you, sleeping during the day, they have the worst sleep of their life. And you just sort of plow yourself through night shift to get to the end of the week. So I started to actually look at um, how, how do we fall asleep and how do we stay asleep? What, what is the, the underlying um, mechanisms, biochemistry? And I remember reading some materials from a, a brilliant functional medicine doctor in America, Dr. Ben Lynch. And I started to understand that sleep isn't as complicated as we've been led to believe and that the, the mechanism of how we fall asleep and stay asleep on a, a chemical level is quite simple. And once we understand that simple pathway, falling asleep and staying asleep is, is very, very easy. Looking at it from the conventional side, if you suffer with insomnia, Normally, the first sort of intervention is sleep hygiene, which is sleep you do before bed and what routines are in place. How can you get the brain into a more relaxed state? And they all play a part, a very serious part, your sleep hygiene and sleep habits. But that is to control an aspect of the biochemistry of sleep without you even understanding that. The second intervention is normally medications like antidepressants or benzodiazepines, which basically tell the brain, just switch off. Now, that leads to rest, but it doesn't lead to actual rest. I was going to say this, Dean, not all sleep's created equal in that sense, is it? Exactly. So basically, your brain has what's called GABA receptors, and these drugs act on GABA and GABA basically is just something in your brain that tells it to switch off to completely relax but when you use say a medication for sleep it just tells the GABA receptor okay switch on but your brain is still active while you're sleeping you're not actually phasing through your brain moves from different um, electromagnetic wave states from alpha beta delta and that's how we dream and how we process information in our sleep you tend to sort of stay in almost like a an active rest position for 
seven or eight hours where your brain hasn't had a chance to actually do some of the the paperwork and filing that it does when you're sleeping to allow you to learn new information, create new memories, etc. So with the whole sleep, I started to realize that two things control our sleep, and that is serotonin, our happy hormone, and melatonin, which people probably know as a supplement, or in fact, it's one of our hormones for sleep. So in order for you to go asleep at night, your body, your brain produces melatonin and it makes you sleepy. And then cortisol wakes you up in the morning. So those two are very intimately connected. Serotonin, our happy feel good chemical is actually what gets our brain to relax at night time. And what we want on the opposite side of it is to have low levels of dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that drives our body. So you want to increase your serotonin level and then decrease the dopamine level in order for have a brain that the environment is relaxed and not stimulated. On a practical level, that's why in terms of sleep hygiene, we cut social media to reduce our dopamine intake. And you might do something like for me, it's gratitude journaling or writing something down, which is a more lower level stimulus and a more le- lower level of of happiness and intake so it's more serotonin than dopamine exactly so we, we want to make sure that the the brain the issue with dopamine in our brain is that it's quite an addictive neurotransmitter and that's why when you lie in bed at night if you allow thoughts to enter your head you start thought chasing and that's where meditation meditation again is intervening with with something that you don't really understand the biochemical level but you understand that that stillness of not thought chasing helps your brain relax. And it's actually because you're telling your brain, I'm not focusing on any other thought, so you stop making dopamine. So I figured, how do I increase serotonin? And I started looking at, you know, my background and obviously with chemistry at supplements, at stuff that we can nutritionally intake in order to support these biochemical pathways. So serotonin, comes from the amino acid tryptophan and dopamine comes from tyrosine. So they're basically complex molecules that started from something basic, an amino acid from protein that we ingest or we have some amino acids in our carbohydrates. Serotonin, tryptophan, we tend to only allow tryptophan into our brain when there's high levels of insulin. And that's why carbohydrates can make you feel tired we have that carb coma um, phrase that people use with serotonin you can intake what's called 5-HTP and 5-HTP is 5-hydroxy tryptophan it's basically the next sort of step from when you take tryptophan into the body but 5-HTP is able to pass into your brain no problem whereas tryptophan needs carbohydrates and insulin to enter the brain. So you can take 5-HTP, it provides your brain with the precursor to serotonin, and then your brain can use it to make serotonin. So I realized if I use 5-HTP, my serotonin level is going to increase. So if I take that 90 minutes before bed, when I get into bed, I've got good levels of serotonin in my brain to help my brain start to calm down. At that point, then I can implement sleep hygiene strategies. So I'm already lowering the dopamine setting. But I can also give the body zinc and magnesium. Zinc, very important for to tell the nervous system to relax. Especially your neural health is based off zinc transport and transmittance. And magnesium controls the enzyme that breaks down your dopamine. So if you give the body a good amount of magnesium, which a lot of people are deficient in, you're giving the body this mineral that helps this enzyme work to remove dopamine from your brain. So now you've got an environment where you've got very high serotonin and your dopamine is starting to fall because of the strategies you put in place and the supplements. Once you're asleep, serotonin gets you to sleep, but 
staying asleep is more critical then as the night progresses. And that's how your brain moves through the different sleep stages from light sleep, dream sleep, REM sleep, and then deep sleep. Staying asleep is based off melatonin. So your brain's making melatonin as you sleep to keep you asleep, to tell your circadian rhythm, it is nighttime, keep the body asleep. People don't realize that melatonin actually comes from serotonin. The creation of melatonin, we're all told that we should get adequate sunlight during the day for our melatonin. Yep. And that's because sunlight stimulates a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. And basically it, it creates melatonin. It, it, it's able to convert precursors from sunlight to melatonin. And that's what your brain releases as it reaches nighttime. That melatonin release from the pineal gland is what makes you start to feel quite drowsy at nighttime and know that bedtime is coming, that sleep onset is coming. But that doesn't keep you asleep. It's the serotonin conversion to melatonin that keeps you asleep. And that's why if you take melatonin as a supplement, you'll find that you fall asleep quite quickly but you wake up quite quickly also. And that's because the half-life of that melatonin, of how long that melatonin stays in your body is extremely quick. Okay. So that melatonin will be out of your system within about three, four hours. So you can take melatonin at like nine or 10 and all of a sudden you're wide awake at two. Yeah, and that's one of the big challenges for shift workers, isn't it? Because if they get back from their shift and they take melatonin and they're hoping to clock six, seven, eight, nine hours it's not going to happen because they wake yeah. during the middle of it because of the half-life expires. Yeah, that's exactly it. So what I realized then was if I can intelligently get my body to convert serotonin to melatonin, it will keep me asleep. What, what's important for that conversion is vitamin B5. So if you take your 5-HTP, your vitamin B5, magnesium, zinc, then with the sleep stack that I created, my sort of first supplement I ever created, I realized that vitamin B6 is very important to help create serotonin as well. And L-theanine is an amino acid that's present in tea. But L-theanine works by acting on those GABA receptors we talked about to tell the GABA receptors to relax. So all of a sudden you've got a brain that's really relaxed creating serotonin from the 5-HTP and creating melatonin because of the vitamin B5. All of a sudden, I was able to come in from shifts, take these supplements and sleep from half five, half eight to five solid with no interruption. What I started to understand then is you can put other strategies in place to try and mitigate some of the health risks for shifts. So, for example, food timing, exercise. I was quite lucky in that we had a gym on site in Intel. So I could train on night shift on my lunch break between one o'clock and half two in the morning. I could train. So I could offset some of the metabolic imbalances of nighttime to my body because I was able to go train. It would increase how my body uses different fuels. So I was able to offset in some shape or form, increase my metabolic capacity for nighttime working. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting because that's just like somebody else training during the day and not training too close to their bedtime because if you're going to sleep at 5.30, I think you said, um, yeah. then it would be really challenging if you were to train <laughs> right before that because your hormones and everything are just popping off. Yeah, and then uh, like the likes of... um I have it on here at the moment, just like a glow on my face, daylight lamps. So a daylight lamp when you're working shifts, I'd put on my daylight lamp, say at seven in the evening at my desk, and I'd leave it on and maybe until half 10 or 11. So what I'm actually trying to do there is tell my circadian rhythm, oh, it's still daytime. Don't make melatonin. And that buys me some time because peak melatonin release is about 10, 11 at night. So when I'm on night shift, I'm sort of delaying my body's release into like the later hours of the morning from that exposure to artificial light 
Yeah. And obviously that's why you don't want to look at your phone at night time either, because or without that blue light blocking feature on our phone, because that is going to tell the brain artificially it's daytime. Yeah. And that's part of the, the sleep hygiene process as well. So that was sort of where I was able to understand um, how sleep evolves from your serotonin and the conversion to melatonin. And I mean, when I transitioned off shift after seven, uh, seven years, seven and a half years, my circadian rhythm is just the same as anyone else's. I don't have issues. I go to bed at 10 o'clock, I wake up at six, no problem. And that's because I had that understanding from my mid twenties of if I'm going to do this sort of um, what you could say is like a category risk towards cancer or cardiovascular disease. I want to make sure that the information I put in place is correct. And yeah. like I said, yeah. from the start, what I got in that hour lecture um, before I started shift, a lot of it was missing information. And it's, it's scary to think that a lot of shift workers are getting this information in job settings, probably because no one's ever sat down and asked some of the questions I asked myself. Um, even in terms of food selection, your digestive processes at nighttime completely slow down. Yet, like the canteen and Intel would serve foods like, you know, typical canteen foods that you're sort of thinking you can probably get away with eating something like that up until about 12 o'clock at night. And then digestion starts to slow down. You, you need to understand, you know, what sort of food you're going to eat for the rest of the night. Are you going to approach a strategy with night shifts, whether you're going to wake up earlier before work and eat your foods and then sort of fast for the rest of the night from maybe 11 until half five yep. and then have your sort of breakfast a half five before you go home to bed. Or are you going to do something like me where I was a bodybuilder? So I was eating, say, every three hours to get my food volume in. But understanding that I had that flexibility because of my training. So my training was making my body more efficient. Yes, my digestion, you'd think, suffered. But when I was on night shift, my circadian rhythm, I would flip my, my sort of... You can't really flip your circadian rhythm. It's not, not the right way to say it, but... My digestive system, if I had to go to the bathroom every day regularly at 8 a.m., that moved to 8 p.m. Yep, yep. And how, how that worked basically was when I was coming onto night shift, I'd fast. So I'd fast from, if I was starting night shift Wednesday night, I would fast from Tuesday night all the way to Wednesday night. Because what I was trying to do was delay my body's I guess, again, your circadian rhythm is based off how you ingest foods. If you can delay that ingestion of food to sort of the same time as you would eat during the day, but at night time, your body now is on a, a clock system whereby it's say, say, sort of seeing that, okay, well, 5 p.m. is now 5 a.m. So if I say on that day shift had my first meal, my breakfast at half five, I was waiting to half five in the evening to start eating for an eye shift. And then I'd roll that pattern for four or five days. Yeah. Incre incredible how your awareness of your health and your nutrition from your bodybuilding and your background has been translated into an area where that albeit slightly regimented approach that you have to have to be a, a, a competitive bodybuilder has actually enabled you to manage your health so well that you've negated much of the carcinogenic risk that a lot of people would associate with night shift? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I had um, a cardiac MRI done last summer um, as a health check to, to my heart. I had a virus in my heart as a teenager, so I get regular heart checks as a consequence of that. But my cardiac MRI was spotless. There was no even incidence of anything wrong in terms of plaque, et cetera, having worked a quite a dangerous time in terms of what can upset your, your body's uh, metabolic rate. There was no health consequence to me working shift because of how I approached the setup and understood, I guess, the underlying biology to, uh, to what night shift does to me. 
Yeah, amazing, Dean. The last area that I want to go with you is regarding serotonin and dopamine. Those two hormones uh, nowadays in modern society are spoken about a lot when it comes to depression. We've applied it really nicely there to sleep, and I think there's a lot of big takeaways there about how we manipulate our levels to maximize the quality and the duration of our sleep. But I'd love to know what you've learned about it in relation to depression, which is such a, a key topic during this period where we, we do have a mental health crisis, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and depression is something that is um, close to home for me in that my own mother suffered with it. Um, so when I went down the road, the road of obviously understanding the, the biochemistry of sleep, etc., that led me into looking at my own genetic data so people can do their 23 and me tests and whatever else and you can take that raw genetic data and see where you potentially have um mutations that have happened from the normal genetic line and we call them snps single nucleotide polymorph polymorphisms snps an smp will show you basically for example, serotonin is broken down in your brain by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, uh, oxidase M-A-O-A. -A. Your genetics will determine how M-O is expressed in your body, in your brain, so how well your serotonin metabolism is going to be. So imagine in the sleep setting, you want serotonin to go over to melatonin, but some of the serotonin is going to get destroyed by MAOA before it even reaches melatonin. What I started to see in my genetics was that my MAOA enzyme works double the speed of a normal person. So in other words, my brain's capacity for creating serotonin is challenged because um, my, the enzyme that destroys it is working faster than a normal person. And then I started to see other issues um, in that your body has these enzymes called CYP enzymes, cytochrome P450, and they help your body to metabolize drugs. And I started to see that some of my CYP enzymes work extremely fast as well. One of them being a CYP that helps metabolize antidepressant medications. And now this all started to tie in. This was like when I was 27. It was such a shame that uh, probably too little too late and that I started to understand sort of potentially an underlying genetic mechanism or functional mechanism towards explaining depression in people who are susceptible to it biochemically. So you now have a scenario whereby my mother, I probably inherited my MAOA from my mother. So now you can you can understand my mother's MAOA enzyme is working at double its speed. Serotonin, we go right back to what I said at the start with sleep, is from tryptophan. The difference here is I'm a bodybuilder and I eat about 250 to 300 grams of protein a day on top of 600 to 700 grams of carbohydrate. My brain, for all of my adult life has gotten enough precursor to serotonin. So I've always kept up with the demand of what my brain needs to create serotonin. Because it burns through could... it so quickly. Because Exactly. Yeah, incredible. And, and that's why then, like, I, I always joke when I'm giving seminars, but I have like a fiery temper. I'm a very chilled person, but anyone who sort of watches Instagram and sees me train, I can harness sort of and flip the switch but if i flip that switch i know that i'm putting my serotonin in danger and i feel it after training i can feel quite down and then all of a sudden i'm getting my post-workout meal in and i'm starting to give the brain back levels of serotonin again and say my mother who's not eating a lot of protein or having this sort of nutritious reg regimen to fuel her serotonin 
you can see then potentially depressive symptoms set in. Um, and what I found very interesting was in, I think it was 2000 and in or early 2019, GlaxoSmithKline bought 23andMe and removed the MAOA gene segment from your genetic data analysis. Is it and you're incentivized for a particular drug that they would like to push? I'm not saying anything, but can you can you see how powerful me now understanding my biochemistry is to future generations of people who who come from a, a, a bloodline from me? So I can tell my son, here's my genetics, here's what potentially could be wrong later on. I would advise, you know, keeping an eye on food intake, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden you just halt the needs for biochemically induced serotonin issues. Yeah. Again, I think it's incredible that there's this golden thread of your bodybuilding and your academic combining <laughs> to lead to you living a more purposeful and actually more healthy lifestyle, particularly with yeah. managing the potential genetic risk that you would have to be susceptible to depressive symptoms through yeah. a high protein diet. And of course, things like managing your serotonin levels around your sleep has a massive impact on our mental health. It allows your brain to repair during the night and support itself. Exactly. And I mean, even as a, as a side of, uh, effect to this, um, again, this is often what I show in seminars. Another thing that came from my genetic analysis was I have APOE two out of four alleles. So APOE is a very important um, lipoprotein in our body. But when you have genetic dysfunction in APOE, it causes plaque deposition in your brain. So when you have these APOE genetic defects, it increases your Alzheimer's risk by about 25%. And now it starts to explain why potentially my grandparents had levels of dementia. And now I can understand that as I age, this is what my genetics are saying. My genetics don't dictate the course of my life if I control how that gene is being expressed. Can I ask what steps you might take to, to manage that then? So it comes back to that oxidative stress, making sure that, again, I'm helping to support my body to lower outside influence, sleep, getting good quality levels of sleep and um, the whole serotonin pathway issue of making me stay asleep and fall asleep to ensure that um, what you have basically is a lymph system in your brain. Like the rest of your body, you have this immune um, river, you could call it. And that river is moving fluid through your brain and clearing away dead cells while you're sleeping. So that's why it's critical that we get good quality sleep to allow the immune system to basically clean up some of the mess that's happening in our brain while we're awake. The dead cells, clear them out and let the, let the, basically give you a, a blank slate to start from the next morning. So those sort of risks, um, fish oils, et cetera, stuff that we know that have uh, impacts towards neuronal health, Simple little things like that, that now that I'm aware of those genetic issues, I can, you know, as I'm approaching my 50s, I can now understand how critically important it is that I actively make conscious decisions to my nutrition and lifestyle because my genetics are saying, well, I've got a 25% risk of Alzheimer's if I don't pay attention to what I'm doing. Yeah, data really is power, Dean, and the way you employ it and the lifestyle changes that you've made around that are something that I think a lot of people can take an awful lot from. And this conversation for me has been so heavily scientific, but so heavily actionable alongside that as well, which I think is that important balance between bringing on somebody like yourself who is so clever, so book smart, but puts forward an actionable way for us to take it forward. And I think fu functional medicine, holistic health, all these buzzwords that we're hearing, when you hear it over an hour, an hour and 20, hour and 30 minute conversation, you understand what lies behind that. So thank you very much for, for enabling us to do that today. No, I'm, I'm very glad. I mean, what, what I started to see was like any sort of um, environment, 
you'll find that people have this sort of not negative opinion on holistic health or functional medicine or whatever you want to put it, because you will always have charlatans in any industry, whether it's financial, uh, health, nutrition, etc. You will always have people that put a negative spin on something for financial gain. And the issue there is that someone could have a functional medicine background and be claiming to be able to cure X, Y, and Z because take this supplement or take this, what, what they're promoting. Uh, what I wanted to do, obviously, was with, with supplement needs is that I will show you the education surrounding, say, for example, heart disease and show you what processes we can put in place to try and offset it. And in the process with supplement needs, I created then products that catered to the root cause of those problems where I made like a heart stack, a liver stack, kidney stack, sleep stack. And giving people this knowledge of this is what's happening biochemically. And if you want to support these biochemical pathways, well, then I've created these products that were created for me personally because I understood the, this biochemical element. And if you think that the information is of a value, well, then here's a product that might help maintain um i could like i said to start increase lifespan decrease disease span yeah incredible dean if people want to continue the conversation with you where should they head towards um they can follow me on instagram if they're on instagram so my instagram handle is dean stm and then we also have um our education portal for supplement needs the sn education website and again that's sort of where I am daily for our paid members answering questions on functional health alongside a, a team of like like-minded experts who I've picked towards training, rehab, nutrition. Um, so that they're the two main places where people can follow. That's and then obviously great. I spoke about the supplement needs range. The website is supplementneeds.co.uk. And if uh, any of your listeners want to save 10%, my code is uh, Dr. Dean. Dr. Dean. All three of those will be linked in the show notes, guys. Thank you once again for joining us. Hope you've enjoyed this one. If you have done, take a screenshot, pop it on your Instagram story, tag me at call.cambro, tag Dean, and I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.